Hello everyone and welcome back to another final match for today of this replay cast. We have Samuel as Samuel as Ed Sam versus Dud Rocket. Really, if you're watching this, Sam, please let me know how you want me to use your name because Samuel as twenty is long. And also, I'm not sure if it's Samuel as or Samuel as Ed or Samuel as. Anyway, and Dude Rocket, which I assume is just Dude Rocket. That that's pretty straightforward. Or Dud Rocket, actually. Dud Rocket is also Dud Rocket seems more likely given to think of it. So Rocket that doesn't fire. Anyway, Dud Rocket going for jump bots and Sam Laz going for rovers. And Fallen Dell, that is an interesting choice. Rovers are a good choice. I think jump bots are just an interesting choice because there are some cliffs. There's some room for jumping around. But basically, if you're going for jump bots on this map, you're going for jump bots because you want to use the specific units they have. Probably placeholders and jacks. And maybe moderators too. Moderators are strong, so yeah, you can see using them. I don't know. A lot of the time you see jump bots either on maps that are very cliffy, because they just jump around and take full advantage of that, or later in the game when someone wants to get a firewalker, because firewalkers are absolute tops when it comes to artillery. Like, seriously, they're pretty much the best non-strider artillery in the game. Well, okay. They share the title with Emissary. Depends what you're trying to do. If you're trying to take down a single thing, Emissary wins. If you're trying to take down an army that's set up outside your base, or a large amount of pork that's, like, light, like, pickets and lotuses and such, and you're just trying to get rid of all that in one go, Firewalkers are your choice. But we are seeing Dud Rocket go for... The pyro early on. Okay. Potter monitor placeholder jack. Alright, fairly typical approach to you know standard jump out composition. Well, Sanilas, did they I don't remember them scouting this. Interesting choice for the fencers. Maybe they just went for the fencers because they wanted to have the relatively safe, essentially defensive option, but I mean it's a good choice. It's it's like it if that's what I'm thinking. Like, did they did they know? I don't think they knew. No, they have no idea. Well, up until they saw the pyro, at least. Samuel Laz had no idea that Dud Rocket, Dud Rocket was going for Jump Bot. I don't like going Dude Rocket. There's no E there, it's Dud Rocket. By Dud Rocket was going for Jump Bots, but... Yeah, Fence was the right choice. <laughs> I just... As a really good choice to come in on. Like, they do a lot of damage to Pyros because the Jump... It doesn't really matter, and it's, I mean, Scorchers aren't a terrible idea. No, Scorchers are a terrible idea. No, Pyro's, Pyro's toast Scorchers, no problem. But yeah, Fencers can stay away and just wipe out the Pyros as the Pyros approach. Like, they outrange Pyros, they home in, so when the Pyro is jumping, it's not like they're, the Pyro is avoiding damage. Yeah, no, that's, that is a good, that is a solid choice for unit type. Now, granted, Dud Rocket is building up some jacks, which will basically hard count on the Fencers. And moderators, which will help deal with the fencers. So it won't last forever. But, you know, it's... Ah. Over to the north. I mean, where the heck is that happening? Samuel has over to the north. Getting rid of a pyro that was stopping their commander. And that's why commanders have lasers. Well. Actually. Wait, is it? I'm trying to remember now. Those, I think it's just largely because it was... That the pea shooter was totally useless. But it might have been specifically for pyros, now that I think about it. That one I don't know offhand. That that change happened years ago, and I don't remember the exact details for why. I think it was basically just because people were upgrading for laser so often, or throwing down lotuses so often, it was kind of... seemed kind of silly. The commander almost was useless without it. However, okay, three pyros against seven fencers. That is... Oh, position like this, that's bad. Like, if the fences were spread out a bit more, I could see it working. If the Pyros had decided to jump in, but they didn't, so the fences are totally fine. But yeah, if the Pyros had jumped in, the fences were quite close. The splash would have taken out a lot of... I think it would have killed them all. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm fairly certain... Yeah, with... Well, let's see. About 70 DPS on... That's 8 seconds per... But all of them are being attacked on the other side... 
52 DPS. That takes... Ah, it's on you. Yeah, no, the Pyros would have won. With the fencers clumped up like this, the Pyros would have won. The fencers have been spread out. The Pyros couldn't have killed them all. They were gonna, would not have been able to burn all of them at the same time. But yeah, being clumped up is bad. So, Sammy Laz, if you're watching this, line move! I say this all the time. I put it into my... I'm pretty sure I put it into my tips video. That's basically my, you know, how to get into this game tutorial video of this is what the game lets you do, do it situation. Line move is absolutely one of those things. It is amazing. The first game today when I was talking about streamline UI... Okay, they are using line move sometimes. All right, I'll, I'll get off it then. Though, when I was talking about streamline UI things, line move was a big part of it. Line move is a big reason why the APM requirements for 0k are quite low to be able to play with the units as intended. It is a huge reason for that. I think more so than the unit... The unit AI thing helps somewhat. The fact that they can dodge... They can jink around shots relatively automatically, although it sometimes helps to do it manually. But line move is a huge reason why APM is not necessary, or at least high APM is not strictly necessary to play this game well. Oh, uh, sorry. In chat, Roughhouse trying to issue bot commands. I don't have a chat bot. Perhaps I should get one of them. But yeah, the YouTube channel... If you're wondering what the YouTube channel is, it's... Shadow Fury 333 is the YouTube channel. But the the actual link will show up during the intermission. And there will be an intermission screen after this. Just a, I will always use one at the very end. Just sort of like... It's kind of a thing. Like both to show that I'm done streaming and also so that you can see those links. So you can see where else you can find me. So yeah, the, the link will be up there. No, that's a fair point. I'll... Uh... Maybe not right now, but I'll, I'll keep it in mind. I'll consider that a vote towards getting a bot in the chan, in the channel, in the chat. My brain mixed up chat and channel, and anyway, put it in the chat. I'll I'll think about it. Like I said, I'll consider your your attempt to use it a vote towards that. Anyhow, back to the game, as the players have been building up. Sorry, it is a bit of a slower game, so I apologize to Dead Rocket and Samuel Laz to a degree, but not a lot has happened. You've been building they've been building up a lot of What in the world are you building up here? I don't see anything on the queue, it's just I mean, unless they're building a Cerberus or something. It's the only thing I can think of that would have that footprint. But why would you build a Cerberus when you have very little energy to begin with? Wouldn't be a power plant. And they're not playing spiders, and they can't really benefit from high ground like that, so I'm not really sure what the point of that is. Oh, okay, they are getting a fusion plant in the backyard. So far, though, it's basically been a bit of posturing, a bit of economic expansion. Samuel has going to the north, building up a lot of overdrive. No one's really taking the north center. Dud Rocket starting to go for that, has a constable handling that. But, again, they are very low in energy until this fusion plant is done. There's not a whole lot they can do. But that's only going to be a few more seconds. So, you know, that'll that'll be done momentarily. At which point, Dead Rocket will be back in the game. Samuel Laz, on the other hand, has been just building up their army this entire time, getting a lot of rippers. Another really good choice. Actually, I would argue a better choice, considering all the jacks. The placeholder will be a bit of a problem, but so long as the rippers are not too close to each other, it... One placeholder is not going to break that army. Not by a long shot. What is Samuel Az's army value relative? No, not by much. It's 700 metal. Okay, it's pretty close. So despite the economic advantage, Samuel Az isn't that... Oh, that's why. No caretakers. Yeah, because Samuel Az... How much, is ex how much are they accessing? Not much more. 1,000 metal more, but still. Two caretakers. That would That would do it. We, Dud Rocket does have those two caretakers. Their problem was a lack of energy. Now they have the caretakers coming in here. They have, they're burning all the metal. What are they building to the south? Oh, just stingers and a shield generator. Are they making a proxy position? I mean, Samuel has must know. Yeah, they have they have radar of this. They have, they have some idea that something's going on, and they they might realize something's going on because if you look, it's a bit of a hard thing to realize. But if you look closely, the radar shadow ends here. They can see this. And I can't remember if terrain shows up in... I think terrain... 
changes sh don't show up in Fog of War until you actually see them. But yeah, the fact that this is these are floating in the sky, just outside of range, should be a hint that something has happened to the terrain. I don't know if Samuel has, has clued into that, because that's like a really weird niche thing. Like the fact that that's you you wouldn't probably consider that possibility unless terrain does show up. Which I can't remember, but. I don't think it... I think it only shows up when you actually see it. At any rate... Oh, placeholder first target hit. Okay, wow, that placeholder goes down. That is huge. Samuel has could easily engage this army and take it out. Like, that placeholder was basically the one thing that I think was at all a threat. Granted, there is a backup army that's... Or a backup squad over in the back. Moderators and Pyros. Oh, yeah, Samuel has... It just seems like they're very, very timid. Dud Rocket as well. Losing the placeholder, though, I can see why you'd be timid. Yeah, Samuel has doesn't really need to be hiding behind... They could have attacked way sooner. That is one thing about this game. Again, this was a request. I can't remember who. I do not remember who requested this. But this was a request, and I have... And I've got a lot of things to say. Main thing is, you can attack a lot more often. Like, it's not wise to attack all the time and lose your units, but you don't have to be never attacking. Granted, it's also important to scout, which is something that you can easily do with the radar towers. Like, just turn them into sparrows and fly them over your opponents. Like, yeah, you don't see that at high level that often, because at higher level play, typically players have a really good idea of what's going on just from experience. And I don't agree with that. I do think that higher level players could benefit from Sparrows. But, ultimately, there are... The strategy can get kind of predictable at high levels. Or at least predictable enough that, you know, they can scout with a handful of raiders, and if it's not what they think it is, then they can adjust and they're not going to lose too many units. But at lower levels, use Sparrows. Like, your opponent is not going to be that much more efficient than you. So, Sparrows, yeah, it's a bit of a cost. It's not much. It's a couple hundred metal. But the information you get is invaluable, so you know when to attack, where to attack. I mean, Radar, of course, on its own is also extremely important, and we are seeing the players make fairly... Well, okay, we're seeing Samuel Laz making fairly strong use of it. Dud Rocket, on the other hand, is not making good use of it. They are just taking a lot of the territory anyway. Yeah, overall, I like. You don't need to have like this overwhelming force. You just need to have the right units in the right place. Like really, with Samuel As's army here, if they had a couple sparrows going around the side, they could see. Oh, there's nothing over to the north. I could send you know three, two or three rippers over to the north, not really weaken my front line position and attack. And if if Dead Rocket decides to go for a retaliatory attack, well, the front line position is strong enough here to easily handle that. And at the same time, there's Rippers going in the back. Dud Rocket might decide, oh crap, I need to retreat and defend, at which point the front line is no longer really under threat and Samuel S could actually advance. Right, that is a huge part of raiding, is knowing when you can attack, where you can attack, and kind of predicting what your opponent is going to do. Like, when you're dealing with armies like this, it's you can just have enough... You have enough forces in your front door that if your opponent goes for a retaliatory attack, you're fine. At, st at higher level play, it's there's a bit more of a sense that you have to kind of know what your opponent's going to do. Like whether they're going to retreat or go for a retaliatory attack. But that's more when you have fewer units as well. When you have this many units, now you can just go for it. Send three rippers over to the north just to explore what's there. Maybe explore to the south. Again, throw out some... Some rate, some sparrows, or if help, go for an air switch and get owls. That is what often used in high level play. Because owls are amazing. But yeah, scouting is huge. And I, we're going to. There are going to be comments. And I know who's going to make them. And I don't want to name any names because I actually quite like their comments. They're, I, they're often quite insightful comments. But they're going to make comments in this game about how the players needed more radar, needed more scouting. And absolutely. Both players need a lot more scouting and a lot more radar. Dud Rocket in particular, they have radar coverage of their opponent's base. What are they even doing in the back lines? They're just accessing metal. I mean, they're building an army, but, you know, I would expect a juggle knot here. 
I, I would seriously expect it to, with 45 metal per second? I mean, granted, only 30 is going into the factory. You need a couple more caretakers, but even 30 metal per second, that's... You now, for the juggernaut, that is not a whole lot of time. All right. That little timer there, that is for when you're dealing with 10 metal per second, just the base factory. So, when you're dealing with 30 metal per second, cut that by a third. So, that would take about 57 seconds. Like, a little under a minute, which is about as long as these jacks are taking, actually. Oh, no. Okay, maybe a little less than jacks. Oh, wait, why are the jacks taking so little time? Oh, because the fusion... What the hell else is going on? The Dead Rock is building up the... E oh, right! The Aegises are eating all the energy! That's... Of course! I'm a silly. That's like... 27 energy per second into the Aegis alone. Yeah, no wonder they can't build. Or they're very, very nearly running out of ability to build, because... Yeah, their commander's using some of it. The Aegises are using a ton of it. Oh yeah, it's not just that, it's also these two. So that's 35 energy per second. No, now it's 42 energy per second on the Aegises alone. Okay, no wonder they can't build consistently. Yeah, Dud Rocket has been completely wiped out by the use of the Aegises. Same time, Samuel has switched over to gunships and... What are they going to do? A drop strategy? Is that the idea? Go for a Revenant? Crow? I don't know. They got the Desolator set up with, with enough grid. I mean, it's not doing the energy sign thing, so yeah. Anyway, Firework coming in. Shields, however, are up. That's kind of- that would be the counter if the Fencers decided to say under the Aegis, but no, that's not happening. Still, again, Samuel has, has a much stronger army. They've been actually building units. They haven't been accessing metal because they have an Aegis, or they have an Aegis addiction. <laughs> it's got like seven Aegises up, eating 49 metal, or 49 energy per second, barely allowing them to produce metal, or actually produce units. But yeah, like by now, Dead Rocket could have had a Juggernaut or two and easily broken this. A couple Juggernauts now would have destroyed everything. Again, though, a lack of scouting. And also a lack of... A lack of production capacity. Like, Dud Rocket needs two or three more caretakers. And I say two or three because they also need to be reclaiming more. And they have a caretaker out here that is looking like it will likely start reclaiming more. Or at least it would if it wasn't on auto and just repairing. But yeah, if... You start reclaiming, you gotta turn that into metal, and so that becomes a bit of a problem. However, Dud Rocket, having lost the Aegises, is actually managing to use up their excess metal because they're only have the Aegises and also the fusion plants coming in there. It was like the best thing Samuel has just did for for Dud Rocket is kill off their shield generators. <laughs> like, no, seriously, let Dud Rocket build the shield generators. They're burning up so much of their energy. I mean, the Locust coming around the side dealing some damage. Granted, the Locust did go into the main base, found the fusion reactors, killed one of them, I think? Not 100% sure. Double check. Or... What's the... Why am I not getting the thing? That's weird. Okay, sorry. I thought there was a... Normally, if you hold Shift and X, it'll show you the explosion radius, but I might have accidentally changed that. Anyhow. I shouldn't have. I don't think I did. That's weird. Normally shows the explosion radius, so you know this is how much damage it'll deal and how wide that is. Does it have it in the unit info? No, it doesn't. Really ought to. Like, seriously? Like, uh, should be Shift X. Is that only one's under construction? Let's find a let's find a builder around here. Sorry, I'm getting distracted, but there's really not a whole lot going on in this game, so I have time. Oh, we don't need to hold Shift X, but it will show up when you're building. 2400, so that is death. Yeah, that is a chain reaction. Three fusion reactors placed adjacent to each other. That is a chain reaction. If the locust. And actually, there's nothing defending it either. Damn. That's where a sparrow would be amazing. 
Because Samuel Az knew that with all the locusts they had, they could have sent the locusts back here, blown up the fusion reactors, and that would have completely destroyed Dead Rocket's economy. Because of all the Aegis. Now granted, the Aegises are also going to destroy it eventually in their own time. But, you know. For now, it's just... Break up the fusion plants, and then they're done. Yeah. I don't know. I, like I said, I can see it as a spectator, but the players can also be building sparrows, or owls, or... A handful of sacrificial units, like a gnat or something. Like a few gnats, just spread them around the map, see what's around. Never a bad thing. Like, as long as you're not gifting your opponent a bunch of metal every time you scout, that's totally worth it. The information is invaluable. At this point, though, yeah, see, 45 energy per second drained... Actually, between all the Aegises. Hang on. 30... Oh, yeah, those are brand new. These are all done charging, so for the time... For the time being, all of these are... Yeah, as you can see, they're not using any energy. But the ones over here are. Because they're all charging. Now, they're done charging. But, yeah, Dead Rocket, once they start getting under attack, that's going to be a problem. And that's kind of the issue with Dead Rocket entirely in this situation, is that anytime they get attacked, they are... Their production is done if these fusion reactors... Okay, granted, the fusion reactors die. That also blows up a bunch of other stuff and ends up killing off the caretakers, so that also destroys the production infrastructure, and the production infrastructure is not keeping up with the fact that they have 60 metal per second income. Well, okay, kind of is. They have Scorpion being built. So there is that. On the other hand, Samuel Az just has a bunch of caretakers. Unfortunately, they, too, have fusion reactors in places that would be suicidal because, you know, 2400 damage across all this is still going to be death. It's still, I think, the fusion reactors might survive, but honestly, it's not going to be a... If they get attacked, it's not going to be just a f spokes attack on a single fusion reactor. It's going to hit all of them, and then, yeah, the splash will kill them. That's... That's not ideal. So yeah, both players are in a situation where they've basically put themselves into... a highly harassable position. And also, no one's actually doing anything. Like, how much army do you do you have? Army value. 25k to 12k. Like, Samuel Az could very, very easily stomp all over Dud Rocket right now. And Dud Rocket has the Scorpion coming up, and I guess they're going to attack with the Scorpion, but it's like, this is not a big team. I'm honestly kind of surprised that neither player is attacking. I, I'm not surprised if one player isn't attacking. Because, you know, sometimes you have players who are more used to FFA or more used to team games where you attack much more cautiously. Especially FFA. Team games, not so much. Team games are pretty dynamic. But FFA, you attack very carefully. Like, you only attack when you absolutely know that you're going to kill. And then be able to defend against the other players when they inevitably attack you because you're weakened. So, this kind of play makes sense in a free-for-all game. It does not make sense when you're playing with... in a 1v1 context... And I'm just surprised that both players are doing it. Like, that's the thing that I'm finding really... And I think largely it comes down to a lack of scouting. I think both players are feeling that here there be dragons issue. That is honestly true of a lot of RTS games. It's, it's one of the hardest things to learn in RTS, and I myself still struggle with it. Having played them for decades, it's still... It's, it is a thing you have to really constantly work to get over. It's that you don't know what your opponent's doing. I mean, you can use scouting and such to learn what your opponent's doing, but this is an imperfect information game. You don't know what your opponent is doing. You don't have full knowledge of what they're building or where they're positioned or all that, but you use radar, or in 0k at least, you have radar, you have sparrows, you have owls later on, you can throw raiders around the map, especially early game, you can throw raiders around the map. Getting information isn't free, but it is relatively cheap. And the thing is... The players could easily have more than enough information to know that they could attack, and could have attacked several times in the last 25 minutes. And the fact that they haven't is honestly... quite surprising. Not entirely surprising, but definitely a thing to fix. Like, I, either side could have won a long time ago if they had chosen to attack in an intelligent way. 
Like, not just straight on its own. That, that would have been unwise. But, you know, if they'd attacked at a point where they were, say, reasonably sure that, like, say, when Dead Rocket was building up the north side, the amulets could attack them. Or when Dead Rocket... Actually, Dead Rocket hasn't really been in a great position. Well, no, Dead Rocket had the three three pyros. They could have gone in and taken out the fencers. That is that is a judgment call, though. But they even could have avoided the fencers entirely and just gone around the side and seen what else was there. I mean, fencers are good. Strong anti-pyro measure, but, you know, they're slow and they have to stop the fire. So the pyros could move around them and then go to the other sides of the map and harass around. And, I mean, Dead Rocket was playing jump bots... Well, they still are, actually. They haven't done any fact switching. So, they are definitely playing a factor that's built more around finding your opponent's weaknesses, needling them, and then ultimately taking them out with stuff like jacks. But you can't... You're not building up an army to just push in. That is not what jump bots do. If you want to do what... If you want to do what Dead Rocket is doing, play shield bots. That is the shield bot way. That is not the jump bot way. The jump bot way is to push in in various places and find holes and exploit those holes as best you can in order to deal a bunch of damage that makes your highly powerful but highly costly units worth their cost. But this is just poor course. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't want to do this, but I'm going to have to. Wait. Oh. There we go. Oops. <laughs> Wrong way! Oh my goodness. Oh, okay, that's a bit too fast. Game says no. We can do four times. Yes, I'm going to four times speed because nothing is happening. Normally in a long game, that's something... A lot of stuff happens, goes back and forth. Normally it's not... Nothing happens. For half an hour... At least. I mean, Dead Rocket just building Paladin Foundry. Finally! Finally we're getting an attack! Oh my goodness, we're actually getting something happening. Samuel has pushing in, taking a lot of fire, literally, thanks to the Firewalkers. And losing most of the Ravage in the process. Nimbus is able to deal a fair bit of damage on the top, but it's really hard to tell, honestly, who is alive anymore. Samuel has losing their commander, having been in the front lines for some reason. However, all the Impalers coming in for extra support does manage to at least hold things down a bit. The Nemesis helping a fair bit, getting rid of some of the Firewalkers, but the Toads are putting a stop to that as best they can. Unfortunately, the Ravagers were all in clump and still are in a clump. Use line move for crying out loud. Actually, that's... I think Samuel has just given Dud Rock at the game because they weren't line moving. Because all the Ravagers got clumped up. You do not point move in this game. You line move. Point move is a noob trap. I am sorry. It is. I mean, Flyrain Runner point in chat. They're, they're pointing out it might have been a pregame agreement. I don't think so. Uh, yeah. No, there's... I, I lost chat history. I don't think it was a pregame agreement. I mean, it might have been. I just doubt it. I think it was just both players are too afraid to attack because they thought something like this would happen, which is a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. This only happened because the units were clumped up. Because they weren't being line-moved. Because it's like, drag, click, drag, line-move. I know Samuel Las knows how to use line-move. They just aren't using it. I don't know why, but they aren't. And if they had been using line-move, they would have completely taken out this position. If the Ravagers were spread out, they would have wiped that position clean off the map probably wiped out the rest of this position as well. Actually, would have, no, would have just gone through here, cut a swath to the south side, probably wiped out Dud Rocket's base, and won the game right there. Like, Samuel Laz should have won right there. They had a army that was, they had an army that was twice as big. They had, like, pretty much the right choice as far as, like, frontline assault units. Like, they had everything going for them, and they still are in a losing position just because they did not line move. They clumped up their units and got killed by splash damage.
I mean, I understand the idea that newbies like super weapons, but I don't think... There's another thing pointed out in chat. But I don't think that's the case. If it were the case, we would have seen a Trinity by now. No joke, we would have seen a nuke launcher. Or at least a tack nuke. We would have seen something to do that. <sighs> Alright, well... I don't expect... Like, I am feeling very reluctant to cast games at Brown Dwarf level. And I typically don't. More out of just kindness, because I figure people at the Brown Dwarf level probably don't want to have their super passive play that's not really doing anything, spending 40 minutes with one or two battles actually on stream, for, recorded for posterity. This was a specific request. But I might just not do them in future as a rule just because this is really passive and honestly kind of boring. And I'm sorry, it is just boring. I, there are tips that I can give about, you know, use your energy, use your scare takers, scout more, attack more, raid more. At least you're reclaiming. I'll give Dudrock that. I have characters in the front to reclaim, so I've, that's good. But there are so many basic things that I think have gone over in just tutorials. Like, I guess it's worth repeating, but I don't think it's worth repeating over and over any time a Brown Dwarf game happens. It's the As with any game, at low level, the mistakes made are typically the same. It, it varies from game, from genre to genre, what those mistakes actually are. But typically speaking, newer players at a game will tend to make similar mistakes. And the advice to be given tends to be quite generic. Because it's not like, oh, you need to use this particular unit composition in this way. And if you'd done that, you would win. No, it, that would be completely the wrong focus. If you're focusing on that, you'd miss the fact that your economy, you're accessing metal, or you're avoiding scouting, or in the RTS case at least, or you are just not building enough units, period. It doesn't matter what the units are, you just don't have enough of them. Or you're not positioning them properly, like you're not moving them, like you're moving them in a way that makes them susceptible to splash damage. Like, that kind of thing is... That's where, I'd say, like, for a newer player, like, that's, that's the key thing. Like, you just, there's, there's no point going into any specifics that would be a game-by-game -game specific. It, gen general advice is good enough because there's a lot of basics that need to be learned before that specifics, or those specifics, become relevant. I, you know, I, I commented on, you know, the way that the radar shows that a unit would have been on high ground over here in the corner... At a higher level play, that would be an interesting thing to point out, because that would be an unusual thing to throw in the bottom, and that'd be useful information. For low level play, that's irrelevant. Like, there's so many other things that are being missed that are more obvious. The high level player would rather have intuited them, or would have scouted them. And that, finally we are seeing at least something come in here. Phantom's coming on the side from Samuel as... Dealing some damage, but my goodness, they let Dutter Rocket build up quite the army. Yeah, I mean, so Flavio Runner pointing out that there's map, that game length is not always a useful indicator, and that's true. It isn't always a useful indicator. I think it's a reasonably okay indicator. Like, map length. If the game is taking a while and the players, I, f I would say, are, like, I don't know, what was it super giant, giant or super giant? Like somewhere in that, somewhere in that rank range, I'd say. If they're that rank range are better and it's a long game, it was probably a back and forth. It was probably an interesting game. At lower level, there might have been a bit more basic mistakes. Maybe someone forgot to reclaim or let themselves excess for a little while or whatever. It might not have been as optimal, but it would still be a back and forth game. But an hour long game between Brown Dwarf players, no, that's just that's this. That is building up your Sim City of defenses. I don't even Sim City really, because just defenses is not like a tech structure or anything. Like not attacking just building up artillery, building up pork until the point that you can't really attack because there's too much there are too many defenses. And everyone just tries to build super weapons, but no, I don't think... If it was a gentleman's agreement, it wouldn't have required all this pork to enforce.
So, I mean, I'm kind of curious where this goes, because, I mean, at least we have the detriment. Like, we might as well have some reward for watching this. Yeah, I... I remember pointing out that long, low-level games are 99% idle or boring. Like, I forgot that. I had forgotten that. I have, I have been given a cruel reminder of that truth. So, I suppose I might as well put this up for posterity. Just to have it up there. But for the record, I am not going to be casting games below giant level. I think Giant will be my my lower limit. Usually I look for Neutron Star. But I think Giant is going to be my limit, which for reference to other games is basically Silver. Silver or Gold, depending on the game you're coming from. But yeah, that, that's like mid-level play. But no, Red Dwarf, Brown Dwarf, no. Like, Nebula, Red Dwarf, Brown Dwarf, all that stuff. No, that's not being casted. I'm sorry. It, it just... It's, if it's a short game, it's probably because one person just did a thing, and that's game. It's usually why games are short. Like, one person just pulls off a really strong strategy early on that wins them the game. And there's no real back and forth. And if it's a long game, then it's this. It's hour-long pork... How long is this game? I didn't even... I should have checked. 62 minutes. So we have another 12, or at least 6, or if my computer agrees, cooperates with me for a little while. Less. Two minutes, if this works, of this match. I apologize, stream. I didn't really think this through. And, yeah, for, for future, I am not going to be, even requests, I'm not going to be doing games below giant rank. I don't like to have, like, a rank limitation it's just that if you're requesting a game for me because you want advice and you're not at giant rank watch my tutorials follow that advice make sure you have your energy make sure you're building with all the resources you have make sure that you're scouting and raiding and just keeping your opponent pressured to some degree at all times or at the very least knowing what your opponent is up to at all times and always 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 be building units Beyond that, like, that will carry you through up until Giant or maybe even Super Giant. Once you get to that rank, then there'll probably be some specifics that you need to worry about. But prior to that rank, no, it doesn't matter. Like, prior to Giant or Super Giant, th that advice will carry you. And no, I haven't tried the new games modes yet. I probably should. That wouldn't be a bad idea. I just don't really think about them, actually. I'm curious. Anyway, Detriment's coming to the north side. Dud Rocket. Got the Detriment. Samuel Az has the Detriment. I mean, it's doing a thing. It's ending the game, if nothing else. And there goes the Detriment. Jump! So, Dud Rocket didn't know the Detriment. Jump! Does get rid of the first detriment? I think the explosion... Yeah, there. Oh, doesn't kill the second detriment. Well, how about that? The second detriment able to take out the rest of the game. And that is it. Dud Rocket winning the match at six times speed. Because screw it, I could not be bothered to wait that long. That is it. Dud Rocket winning basically because Samuel Az just clumped up all their units. That's the other thing. Line move. So, for the record, let's review... So I don't have to say this again. Actually, I shouldn't have to say it again anyway because I have the video up, but the takeaway from this match is I, this was a request, and I do want to make sure that I at least give some some advice to the player who requested it. I don't remember who it was. Probably Dud Rocket. So, four things. Make sure you are always scouting and know what your opponent is up to. Radar towers will morph into sparrows. It's pretty cheap. And it's a very cheap flying unit that lets you just see what's going on. So it's a great cheap way of doing it if you don't want to risk using raiders. You don't feel confident in your micromanagement for the raiders. Just set up a troll for the sparrows. That'll do the trick. Two. Make sure whatever you're doing 
that you're not burning up your... You have enough energy to build with. And, yeah, you don't need this many Aegises. So, like, the fusion reactors are only needed because of all the Aegises. The Aegises were only needed... I don't know why, actually. Because the where they were used didn't really make a difference. The front line, it kind of did, but... Like, honestly... The, uh, you could have ended the game 20 minutes sooner if you hadn't bothered. Or, I don't know, 20 minutes. 40 minutes sooner if you hadn't bothered. So, yeah. Like, make sure you have enough energy for the production. And so you're not accessing. Make sure this is not flashing. Make sure this... Make sure the metal bar is not flashing. Make sure the energy bar not, is not empty. If either of those are the case, and you have either Aegises or Irises, both of which consume energy on a regular, on a continuous basis, turn them off. Or Corneas, sorry, Irises is the mobile version. Area cloaking in general. Area cloaking or large area shields. Small area shields, like pretty much every every shield unit but the Aspis, the mobile version of the Aegis, has free shield charging. As of now, as of the time of this recording. I, I don't expect that to change, but in case it does, as of the time of this recording, that is the case for Shieldbot units. Aegis and Aspis, same unit, just different forms, are the only exception to this. So, other than that, like, if you have like, Aegis's, Aspis's on shields or anything using Area Cloak, turning those off first is going to save you a lot of energy, allowing you to get the units you need with the production. Third, related to that, make sure you have enough build power going into your factories to use up the metal and energy you have. It's not a bad idea to have a little extra build power, because then you can use Reclaim, so long as you have the energy to actually spend it. And lastly, more so for Samuel as than for Dud Rocket, don't be afraid of pulling away a few units to attack. Like, your front line is probably going to be fine, just... Now, it's part of the scouting thing, the first thing, but again, do make sure to attack. If, you know, double check your opponent's periphery. A lot of times, players will, especially at lower levels, will expand either without defending too much or won't expand that quickly. In the former case, you can just wipe out the metal extractors, no problem. In the latter case, it's a little bit more complicated, but basically you can set up a contain. As long as you know, okay, they're expanding here, whatever, you can have like one or two units staked out, and then if they try to send a constructor over, well, they either have to have support units, so the front line's weaker and you can actually attack the front line, or they don't send support units and you get a free constructor kill. Either way, you win. So yeah, to review. Scouting. Always scout. Always keep an eye on your energy, both in terms of things draining energy and energy production. Make sure that you have all of your production that you can going into units like as a regular thing. And... Whenever it's even remotely feasible, especially when you've used point one to scout out the opponent's base and opponent's overall territory, attack. Like, frequently apply pressure. Now, of course, there are other tips, too, that I'm not giving, but that's because they actually did them. Like, reclaiming. They did reclaim. Oh, yeah. And five, use line move. <laughs> line move keeps you safe from splash damage. That is why it is a thing. Use line move. Okay. Rant over. I hope that was helpful. I realize this is like 50 minutes into the video. For anyone watching on YouTube, if you watched this far, thank you. Though, honestly, again, I have covered this in tutorial videos. This is, I think Google Frog has as well. So, this is not new. These are pretty basic. This is kind of why the tutorial videos exist. But I will give credit where it's due. Reclaiming was done, and caretakers were built not as much as they needed to be, but they were built. And energy was ultimately dealt with. Like, it wasn't like this stuff wasn't dealt with. The key thing was a lack of scouting and a lack of pressure. It's just there were key points in the game where a lack of energy was a big problem and a lack of caretakers and build power to the primary factory was slowing things down. But scouting and attacking, those are the key things. Those, like, if you can, and line move. Like, those are the things that weren't done the other two just weren't done as well as they could have been, but yeah. But yeah, the rest of that, that's covered in tutorials. That's, I, I've said that already. And yeah, for the record, again, giant is the, is the minimum for now for games, even by request. If you're below giant rank, re-listen to my rant I just gave. 
follow that advice. You'll probably get a giant rank pretty quickly just because you'll be winning games against players who aren't doing those things and basically don't have enough units. And then feel free to request replays because your games will probably have interesting per game things that I can comment on and showcase and give you advice on perhaps. But below that, just follow the generic basics advice. It's you you're at the level where that is that is what you need to focus on. Anyway, that's that. Thank you for watching. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>